Okay, so this is one of those necessary evil kind of lectures. So basically the chapter argues that grammar isn't boring, it's just simply a means to an end. So for this class, understanding grammar rules is essential to constructing your paper, but as far as grammar rules, they are kind of boring. But what the chapter is trying to argue is when you have a better understanding of grammar rules, you'll be more empowered to use that information to make your writing less laborious and annoying. So first they talk about how grammar describes, it does not prescribe. Meaning it's not about telling you what not to do. It's really just trying to understand how the language works, how it's structured, how it functions. Um, and also the primary purpose of grammar is to describe change and development. So grammar seems like some eternal fixed thing, but it is in flux as language is itself. And this grows and transforms over time. So just think about watching an old movie. Would their grammar rules be the same as ours? Or I'm sure you've read something in school that was Old English, such as Shakespeare. And you encounter a lot of thous and other words and phrases that seem alien to us today. Language, like other things in the culture, is a reflection of the current socio-cultural political time period. Right? So it changes. So grammar is worth studying. As it says in the chapter, grammar helps us to express our ideas. We want to be understood clearly and effectively in both our speech and our writing. So if we want our writing to be communicative and effective to others, what we're trying to do is make sure that what we're writing is what people are interpreting it the way that we mean it. So when grammar is poor, it causes interruptions to the reader. It breaks up the flow of the paper. And it makes it really a lot less readable. So when it comes to usage, grammar is concerned with the structure of language. So really, it's just trying to understand the way that words function linguistically. But usage is constantly changing. As the language changes, so does usage itself. So really, this is why you have to stop worrying about the rules of grammar. The biggest mistake that leads to writer's block is worrying about grammar and trying to write the perfect sentence top to bottom. Remember, that is fighting how your brain works. You, you need to use proper grammar, but that's something that comes with editing your paper, as it's nearly impossible to write the perfect sentence top to bottom, intro to conclusion. It's just not that simple. So attitudes about usage itself have become far less rigid in recent years. So like weird internet words have become normal to us. We incorporate these new words into our understanding. So like kind of like that Kellyanne Conway thing when she birthed the term alternative facts, right? It became part of the cultural lexicon, but obviously in the worst way possible because she's terrible and she gets paid to be terrible, but whatever. Um, what I, you get what I mean. I'm talking about not only how terms arise in the general lexicon, but also the general relaxation of those previous rules, um, you know, in our, in our time period. So for your paper, you can use the term I, which I understand is discouraged for a lot of research papers. But for this one, I ask that you explain positionality in some ways that other papers or papers from different disciplines would not ask. Um, so that's kind of a little bit different from that perspective. You can include yourself a bit, not obviously just writing from your perspective. It is a research paper. But um, if talking about the method or developing the intro, there's various different ways that, you know, your positionality could be um, brought into it from the eye. But there is something that's kind of strict within um, research papers or sociological research writing um, where you can just not use any contractions, which is difficult because I know we use them a lot when we talk. Um, you know, things like don't that are common when we're speaking just aren't acceptable in academic sociological research papers. Unless you're like, it's someone's quote, you know, or, um, you know, you did an interview and you were using someone's quote. Otherwise, um, you know, you're not allowed to use contractions. But again, that's something that you tend to look at when you're revising drafts of your paper. You're not going to necessarily write everything perfect <laughs> the first time. That's kind of the whole point is if you let go of trying to do it perfectly and just do it, and then just keep drafting it, you will end up with a great result um, in a lot with a lot less stress, <laughs> right? So um, when it comes to the, the basic grammatical terms, um, first off, you have parts of speech. Basically, those are just groups of words that are, you know, grammar's trying to understand how words work. So they group certain words together that have similar functions in our language. And some of the words fall into multiple categories. So there's, you know, different parts of speech like nouns, pronouns, 
verbs, adjectives, adverbs, conjunctions, prepositions, interjections. They're all parts of speech. So when it comes to those, a noun is the name of a person, place, or thing. A pronoun is just a substitute for a noun. Like instead of saying someone's name, you would say she or something like that. Um, a verb is something that expresses action, right? Either an action, a condition, or a state of being. Um, an adjective is a word that modifies a noun or a pronoun. An adverb is something that modifies a verb, adjective, or another adverb. A conjunction is something that links words or groups of words together. A preposition just shows a relationship between nouns and pronouns. Um, and an interjection is just an independently expressed feeling. So these are all different ways um, that grammar has kind of been organized to be understood. So when you're writing and going through this process, you know, you need to learn to distinguish between verbs and verbals. Um, for, you know, first off, verbs are, you know, again, words used to describe an action, state, or occurrence, um, while a verbal is a little bit different. A verbal is a word or words that function as a verb. So, for example, um, she slept in. Slept functions as the verb because she's performing the action. So another example would be jogging three miles every day is good for you. To jog is a verb, but in this case, jogging is used as a verbal, right? Jogging is not, you're not describing a specific like, you know, Sam was jogging or Sam is jogging. Um, you're saying jogging three miles every day is good for you. So it sounds like a verb in the same kind of way, um, but it's a verbal because it's not as an actual um, relationship to direct action. Um, identifying phrases is another important thing. A phrase is just a group or pairing of uh, words in English. And so a phrase can be long or short, but it does not have like a subject verb pairing that makes it its own clause. A clause is typically a subject plus a verb. So the subject is usually, quote, doing the action of the sentence, right? That verb is the action that the subject completes. A clause creates a complete thought or an idea or statement that can stand alone. Or, you know, sometimes that's also caused, called a uh, main clause or independent clause. Also, there's this situation of agreement. So this is where we often read passages and think something sounds wrong to us. Um, often it's because there's an agreement issue. So a predicate. Um, usually agrees with the subject in the person and numbers, meaning if you're talking about one person, you're not going to use a plural. Um, if you're talking about a person that's gendered male, you're not going to use the word she, right? So there are a lot of examples of these issues in the chapter. Um, when it comes to agreement of pronoun and antecedent, so this is similar in the agreement issues as above um, because you have to have an agreement in the person doing the action, the gender, and the number of people. Um, case itself is just the form of a noun or pronoun takes when it's establishing a relationship to other words in a sentence. So there's different kinds of case. There's uh, nominative and um, objective. So nominative is an indication of the person doing an action, while objective indicates the person or thing that's being acted upon. So there's some tricky ways that these two are not mutually exclusive, which they get into with a bunch of examples in the chapter. Verbs are, um, you know, obviously a very important part of uh, grammar. So principal parts of verb are just those tenses, right? Present tense, past tense, past participle. Um, when it comes to troublesome verbs, there's a list of 50 troublesome verbs that cause common grammar mistakes. So it's worth reviewing on page 48 and 49 in the chapter. Um, when it comes to linking verbs, uh, most verbs are going to describe action, but some describe a state of being, not of action. Those are typically linking verbs. And then there's also auxiliary verbs. These are the kind that establish a mood or tense. Um, and when it comes to tense and tone, tense is the time of an action. So is it in the past? Is it in the present? Is it in the future? While the tone is more about communicating effective meanings. And voice itself is where we either see passive or active voice. So passive voice is more common in academic writing, but it's also why we sometimes read it and it seems lifeless. 
active voice is more direct, and it's the approach I suggest you try for some aspects of your paper. There are situations where passive voice makes sense, such as talking about a group of people who receive something, but the problem is that in passive voice you often focus more on the result of the action, more so than focusing on the actor or subject of the sentence. So, you know, you will get some opportunities to practice passive and active voice as one of your weekly writing exercises, so you'll be pretty um, familiar with this. Okay, when it comes to adjectives and adverbs, um, adjectives are just uh, words that modify pronouns and nouns in describing them, right? And adverbs are similar, they also modify, but they're modifying verbs, adjectives, or even other adverbs. So guidelines that outline proper use for adjectives and adverbs can be found on page 58 and 59 of your chapter. Um, conjunctions are linking words that are used to connect words or groups of words in a sentence. So there's a couple different things that conjunctions do. Well, specifically, your chapter says there's four things that conjunctions do. Um, so the first is distinguish among the meanings of conjunctions and conjunctive adverbials. Also, they use correlative conjunctions to correlate only two ideas. So this is another important rule because there's going to basically be, like in the first one, they're talking about establishing a logical relationship between ideas. But if there's more than two ideas, um, that's not, like, it's, it's really not possible for a conjunction to um, wed more than two of those ideas. So it has to be limited. Um, also, you need to avoid using a conjunctive adverb to join words or phrases to dependent clauses. So you wouldn't say things like, my favorite sports are soccer, volleyball, also hockey. Right? You would say something like, my favorite sports are soccer, volleyball, and hockey. So there's certain kind of relationships between how you would list how what kind of words go together, um, where if you start your sentence with one, you kind of need to finish it with, with the other. So something like either or, you know, um, do you prefer either this or that? You wouldn't say either and, right? Um, so there's certain relationships there. And again, um, your chapter really gets into a lot of those examples. Um, and of course, be careful in using like as a subordinating conjunction. Sometimes overuse of like is just kind of a lazy representation of a lack of other vocab that could have had a clearer meaning. So sure, things are like something, but also they might have, you, there might be other words that are more um, appropriate to use in those situations. So I couldn't talk about conjunctions without involving my, my childhood, because of course, so um, I'm going to end this lecture with a little classic video that hopefully you have seen already. If you haven't, you're welcome. As your body grows bigger, your mind must flower. It's great to learn, because knowledge is power. It's Schoolhouse Rocky, the chip on the block of your favorite schoolhouse, schoolhouse rock. You've been waiting for Conjunction Junction. Junction, junction, what's your function? Hooking up words and phrases and clauses. Conjunction, junction, how's that function? I got three favorite cards that get most of my job done. Conjunction, junction, what's their function? I got and, button, or, they'll get you pretty far. And, that's an additive, like this and that. Sort of the opposite, not this, but that. And then there's or, O R. When you have a choice like this or that, and but no, get you pretty far. Conjunction, junction, what's your function? Hooking up two box cars, making them run right. Milk and honey, bread and butter, peas and rice. Hey, that's nice. Dirty butt, happy digging and scratching, losing your shoe and a button or two. He's poor but honest, sad but true. Boo -hoo 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 -hoo. Conjunction, junction, what's your function? Hooking up two cars to one when you say something like this. Choice, either now or later, or no choice. Neither now nor ever. Hey, that's clever. Eat this or that, grow thin or fat. Never mind, I wouldn't do that. I'm fat enough now. Conjunction, junction, what's your function? Hooking up phrases and clauses that balance like 
Out of the frying pan and into the fire. He cut loose the sandbags, but the balloon wouldn't go any higher. Let's go up to the mountains or down to the seas. You should always say thank you or at least say please. What's your function? Hooking up words and phrases and clauses in complex sentences like In the mornings when I'm usually wide awake I love to take a walk through the gardens and down by the lake Where I often see a duck and a drake And I wonder as I walk by just what they'd say if they could speak Although I know that's an absurd thought Conjunction, junction, what's your function? Hooking up cars and making them function Conjunction, junction, how's that function? I like tying up words and phrases and clauses Conjunction, junction, watch that function I'm gonna get you there if you're very careful Conjunction, junction, what's your function? I'm going to get you there if you're very careful Conjunction, junction, what's your function? I'm going to get you there